Well, I think in Stanford's case, Humbaya was really formed largely because there was an opportunity because of the Ford Foundation's interest in sponsoring something that would sort of combine the social sciences and the biological sciences in a, in a different way. It was really before there was a substantial interest in universities in interdisciplinary programs of study. Uh, now, they're a key feature of the current campaign for Stanford, but in those days, uh, they were not so familiar at all. And uh, so the idea was that there would be endowment available to support faculty positions and an opportunity for the university and its faculty cre to create a new combination of disciplines. Much of it could have been done in a biology department and many of the early people in the program in human biology had taught in the biology department and even continued to do so. Craig Heller did, I did, Paul, Paul did some of both. There were people on the medical school faculty who moved between the medical school and the human biology program because they liked to teach undergraduates uh, and not uh, uh, a steady diet of, of medical students. This was very explicitly aimed at improving the quality of undergraduate education. So it was not a program that had uh, a large graduate tail that might one day come to wag it. But in fact, uh, it, it was always an undergraduate program and it turned out to be pretty popular. I remember the, 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 very few, the very few students that were in the very first classes had uh, developed a very uh, strong attraction to the kind of combination that uh, human biology offered. And they spoke to others. Uh, we paid much more attention to students in, on committees with faculty, to student advisors, to course assistants who worked with faculty, so that students really felt that they had a stake in the program and how it ran. So I think that was one of the reasons why its popularity grew quite quickly after those early classes of the, of the 71, 72, 73, uh, it got quite a lot more popular. I remember that we got Colin Pittendrick, who had been, who, who we had recruited, he had been Dean of the Graduate School at Princeton, and we got him, I think, uh, with the lure that uh, we were closer actually to his favorite trout fishing streams than, than Princeton was. He gave a, a brilliant series of lectures in an introductory course, the first time we had an introductory course before the core that a spring quarter freshman could take to get introduced to the program. And Pittenrick had worked for the British government in Trinidad during the war and had he had been working on the yellow fever problem and he started working on the circadian cycles of mosquitoes that bred in bromeliads in the trees in Trinidad and how that might relate to uh, the infectious disease problems that they were encountering there. He gave a fascinated lecture on the, e on the ecology of bromeliads, the water that they trap, the mosquitoes that use them, the, the whole ecosystem, which, which I thought was, was really terrific. And it got, it got the students very excited. It made those of us teaching in the core feel a little odd because I, we, we, we thought Pittendrick was a little bit more of a master of, of that kind of uh, lecture than, than some of us were, but, uh, but uh, he, he, uh, he, set a great, he set a great standard for us. Great lesson for me was the immense value of team teaching when you are teaching with other people in a course, let's say one quarter of the human biology core. Uh, 
you're lecturing after other faculty members and they're often in the audience and you're in the audience when they have lectured. And when I was starting to do something in, in an area where I knew, for example, Craig Heller knew better than I do, I, I would go part of the way and I would say such and such and so and so. Craig, should I amplify that a little bit or, or something like that? And, 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 they, and they would then feel free to kick in. I would like to think that on one of those occasions, I suddenly said, well, here's how, I, how far I got. Can anybody else figure, help me figure out where I was going? I don't know that I did that. I want to believe that I did something like that. When Jim Phelps was a student advisor in human biology, we thought it was really terribly interesting. He, he was quite athletic. Uh, very interesting. I, I used to try to play two-man volleyball with him, but he was lots better than I was. We were really fascinated with the sort of biology and, and, and uh, mechanics of movement. We decided to teach a human bioseminar on movement, and, and we, we developed a tentative title for it, which was Man in Motion. And we suddenly realized that we were being male chauvinist pigs <laughs> in the title. And so we had, to, we had to change it. I think it was first listed that way, and then we had to relist it. One of the things I always hoped for from human biology students would be that if they enter the healthcare system, whether is it is from a policy perspective or from a practitioner perspective, that, that they would focus a little bit on what it is to be, really, to be somebody who thinks about the patient and the patient's interests, what the context in which they take new information is and what they are therefore likely to do about it. You, you suppose that there's a detection, uh, a diagnostic test that will allow you to measure in a, a pregnant woman uh, the content of a, of a molecule called alpha, alpha fetoprotein uh, in the blood. Alpha fetoprotein is a likely indicator of a failure of anterior neural tube closure, closure in her fetus. Probably she's going to have uh, a pretty severely disabled baby. Uh, depending on how uh, doctors feel about abortion, right to life issues, and so forth, uh, people in the health community will be a little uh, divided about how FDA ought to approach the approval of a diagnostic device to accomplish that measurement. It depends on the context in which they put it. But I, I, but I do think that the purpose of a good interdisciplinary undergraduate program is to, is to give people some real occasions in which they can structure their own capacity to process their information, to process their own beliefs, to integrate it with their personal philosophy and their hopes for themselves, and ultimately make better choices on the grounds of that, of that fusion. Early on, when a quarter started to develop uh, a kind of emphasis on policy studies in the core, there developed a, a string of, of course tracks that, first of all, I think included both health and environment. That is, people who are interested in conservation, environmental policy, and eventually, much later, climate change and energy policy. Some, some human biology faculty member will be likely to be, as I would have been, uh, fairly active proponents of the climate change consensus and of actions based on the climate change consensus. But that's, that's in their role as, as 
advocates for a particular set of policy outcomes, and I think they're entitled to those roles. Uh, I think one, one good feature of the human biology program is that it would be open to the economic arguments that would say, yes, uh, uh, it, yes, maybe there's a problem. We don't know exactly what the risks are. It's deferred in time, likely. We don't know what the ra discount rate will be. Uh, uh, to, to be applied over, over the whatever number of years it is, uh, but we think that it will cost jobs in a difficult economy, and we think it's not a good idea. And I think human biology students ought to hear those arguments and uh, that, that their proponents ought to be free to publish op-eds or blogs or whatever, which, which they're likely to do. So uh, you, 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 certainly, you, you, you certainly don't get away with anything by, by being able to say, I'm a so-and-so, and so I'm not, I, I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, I, think, I think in human biology, the tradition is pretty strongly on the other side to say uh, either, I'm an economist and I, think, I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense, or uh, uh, I'm not an economist, but, but the economists I talk to have convinced me that so and so. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a pretty free marketplace of, of ideas and convictions. Some of the students bring their own and are dissuaded from those co convictions. Some of them don't bring any inform them. Well, I, I, as some of our human bio graduates may have, may have encountered as they went into PhD programs in other places that, uh, that uh, in, in their own efforts to try to express their views in more general, generally understood terms, that their, their mentors say, well, well, that's all fine, but, but you, you don't want to get a reputation for being primarily interested in speaking to the public, better tend to your thesis and, and uh, leave that for later. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little discouraging to some young faculty members who are hungry for tenure and recognition and who nevertheless uh, have enough curiosity about expressing and explaining what they do to want to talk to reporters. I've always asked a question at the end of doctoral exams, what's the elevator speech, or, or how, how, how would you explain that to a very intelligent but, but, but uh, uh, not science literate friend uh, if, if you had a ride up to the top floor on an elevator uh, and had to complete your, your explanation before you got there. He was very good about that, and uh, he, he was he, he, and he was a terrific educator because he could, he was, he was very good on the analytic side and on the math side. And so he could, he could convince people, even people who didn't have a lot of mathematical talent, that, uh, that uh, uh, he, he, was, he was right in a particular set of assertions about mechanisms of climate change. And... Uh, I, I respected him an awful lot for his ability to, uh, to tackle those questions head on and do it in a way that involved real, really thoughtful and solid explanation. He, he got attacked a lot, but you know, the, the, a lot of people in the media who were not totally sympathetic with his views really still respected him. It all came from seeing them much later. It all came from finding them much later in my life and theirs. Uh, where, I mean, I meet, <laughs> uh, 
a woman who's at NIH, very, very active in, in, develop, in vaccine development. Uh, her husband uh, is a, turns out to be a very good friend of, of my daughter's. We meet at a dinner party, and it turns out she announces she's a human biograph. Half the doctors my friends see in Washington, D.C. turn out to be human biology graduates. Deborah Zarin, who was, who was uh, uh, one of my favorite course assistants, she and, she and her best friend uh, uh, both, both worked with me. She's, she's now at NIH. She's the director of clinicaltrials.gov. So it's just... It's just wonderful to see them just do, do these great things. So the, the in, inspiration I get about the program and the course and its history comes, a great deal of it comes from, from its graduates and seeing what they say about it and what, how they say it fit into their own personal ambitions and their, and their lives.